Do you think that House Targaryen wants for strength? And someone offered you more dragons? Would you not take them? Do you have dragons to offer? Hey guys, Pete here. Today I'll be talking about the third episode of House of the Dragon. The one where, if you haven't read ahead like I have, you might start to wonder if any of this had to happen. Things get interesting as we jump forward in time, and welcome another member to the family of House Targaryen. Other prominent Westerosi players close to the king start to get some ideas, and all the king wants to do is hunt and not have so many problems with his daughter, who he thinks is a contrarian that is not taking her role as his heir seriously. She senses that he might be the only one that wants that and resists attempts to have her marry as a way to reinforce her position as the future leader of the Seven Kingdoms. I'll be getting into all of what happened, but do have to warn you about spoilers. If you haven't watched a second of his name yet, then this video won't be for you. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. Last week we jumped ahead six months, and this week we've gone forward three years. Viserys announced he would marry Allison at the end of episode 2, and now they have a son that's celebrating his second birthday. You see that there are murmurs about him naming baby Aegon his heir, now that his infancy is behind him. That's where the title of the episode comes from. He would be the second Aegon to rule the realm if he ascends to the Iron Throne, with the first being the Conqueror that started all this off. The king seems more than happy to just celebrate his son's day, but he gets interrupted by his current master of ships, a persistent Tylan Lannister who wants to discuss the Stepstones. I probably don't need to remind many people that the Lannister family plays an important role in Game of Thrones. However, if you're new to this world, they are a powerful family, and I'm sure we'll learn a lot more about them as the season goes on. Tylan took over the role after Corlys bounced out of King's Landing, and in his following the king around we get a general idea that things haven't been going well and that the crown is still not interested in helping since Damon and Corlys went off to start their war without his blessing. As Viserys gets more annoyed with Tyland, you see that he's also upset that Rhaenyra isn't there. She's out in the Godswood reading and having a musician play the same song for her over and over. Alicent comes out to try to get her to come on the hunt with her father. It's clear that their friendship is a lot different than the last time we saw them here. And based on this exchange, it seems like Rhaenyra hasn't gotten over the fact that she married her father and that she doesn't keep that a secret. It seems like Alicent might be trying to make an effort to make things better, but in the end, after we see that she's the more powerful of the two as the queen, she essentially orders Rhaenyra to join them. In their coach, Viserys is still loving the dad life, and brings up that soon it will be Rhaenyra's turn to make some babies of her own and make him a grandsire. Alicent, who looks like she's about to give birth to their second child at any second, tries to tell her pregnancy isn't so bad. When she isn't interested in that, her father tries to get her excited to ride with him during the hunt, and again she's not interested. They have a brief back and forth, and when he pushes her to take up her duties as the princess, she says, no one's here for me, and this is something that will come up a couple of times throughout the episode. When he arrives at the hunt, you get the sense that this is what his reign is all about. Tourneys, hunts, and lots of feasts, which I suppose is fitting for a peacetime king. When they arrive, you see some new characters. You see Lionel Strong, his master of laws with his two sons, Harwin, aka Breakbones, and Laris, aka the Clubfoot. You also see Tylan Lannister again, and this time with his twin brother, Jason, who is played by the same actor rather than twins. You also see Otto's big brother, Hobart, for the second time this episode. You can't forget that Otto also has that second son energy, even though he's pretty important as the hand in King's Landing. And it's fairly obvious that Hobart wants to see Aegon replace Rhaenyra as the heir. In case it's not obvious, Allison is a Hightower, so having her son and line take over would be great for his family and everyone in Old Town. This is all important, and it's something that I'll come back around to towards the end. In the last episode, we saw that no one at court was really warming up to the fact that she is the king's choice. 
And in this episode, three years later, we see her sort of wandering around looking like she has no place. There's talk from the ladies from houses Lannister and Redwine that the king should intervene in the Stepstones, and she reminds them that it's not the crown that's at war. She also mentions that she hasn't talked to Damon for years, which leads us to believe that the last time they saw each other was on that bridge at Dragonstone. Say what you will about how good Viserys is at being king, but it looks like he throws one hell of a barbecue. There we see Jason Lannister introduce himself, and he comes on pretty strong to Rhaenyra. He mentions building a dragon pit, and when she asks why he'd do that, he says that he'd do anything for his queen or his lady wife. She gets the idea that he's presenting himself as a potential suitor and decides to leave. It's also important that he says, or my lady wife, because it shows that he doesn't think she'll end up being the heir now that Aegon is in the picture. She goes to her father to complain, and he gets worked up saying that ever since she came of age, he's been bombarded by proposals. He's tried to discuss it with her, but she hasn't been interested, and things start to get loud when she says she doesn't want to get married. He shouts that even he isn't above tradition and duty, and makes a scene of arguing with her about it in front of everyone. Otto interjects that there's been a sighting of the White Hart, a large deer they call the King of the Kingswood, and she takes the chance to go outside and mount her horse and take off, and Sir Kristen Cole follows her. There's a chase, he finally catches up to her, and they have a heart-to-heart about their different stations and how she thinks he's lucky that he had a choice in how to live his life. And I mean, the grass is always greener on the other side, but how about a little self-awareness from the princess who had the most decked-out reading spot I've ever seen, and another live human being there to perform her songs on repeat. And that's the thing about this episode and these people. There isn't any. They're all on a scale of being insufferable which I suppose everyone is depending on your perspective, but these people have power. Maybe not as much as they'd like in their respective positions, but real power based on who they are, and I brought this up in my video last week, when they don't get what they want, there will be consequences, and it's usually other people who pay the price. And speaking of other people doing things for you, there's a massive group of people coordinating this hunt for the king, and he gets some word on the white heart and some droppings to examine. This gets Otto pumped up because he sees a way in and says that this might be important. If the gods were to decide to show their favor, it would all be conveniently pointing to his grandson needing to become the king of the realm. Jason Lannister presents the now drinking king with a spear. Those drinks bring out a different side of Viserys. When Jason again brings up the idea of Rhaenyra being passed over, the king takes offense. It's clear there's interest in replacing her, but Viserys seems to be sticking with his decision. He proclaims that he didn't name his daughter his heir on a whim, and all the lords of the kingdom would do well to remember that. When he talks to Otto later about Jason's pride having pride and echoing what Rhaenyra said about him earlier, his hand responds that she'll do as you command. And this opens up the door for the king to say that he actually wants her to be happy. In another attempt to position his two-year-old grandson to be the heir, he suggests that maybe they should betroth them to each other. And that leads Viserys to say he came there for the hunt, not all of this politicking, which you can see is definitely driving him a little bit nuts. He lets his frustration show again when he's talking to Lionel when he says, Fine Targaryen king I am, powerless over mine own daughter of seven and ten. His master of laws brings up the problems that the very popular king Jaehaerys had with his own daughters, saying that this is just tradition. And I don't want to go down that rabbit hole here, but I'll just mention that one of the good king's daughters ended up a sex worker in lease, and the king decided just to leave her there. He also offers up his opinion on what the king should do, and to Viserys' surprise, he's not suggesting his own son, but instead he suggests that he should marry Rhaenyra to the sea snakes. And his reasoning is still the same as when he told the king to marry his sister, Lena. Rhaenyra is still hiding out in the woods with Kristen, and she asks him if he thinks the realm will ever accept her as its queen. He points out that they have no choice, and then things get crazy when a wild boar charges him, and he stabs it when it tries to attack Rhaenyra. Then when it's laying on the ground and it moves again, she stabs it repeatedly with her dagger. 
which I suppose shows that she can take care of things herself when necessary. If you're wondering what all of this is about, obviously there's some chemistry here, and we've seen that continue from the first episode, and you just need to remember that this is forbidden fruit. The members of the Kingsguard take a vow of celibacy, and it's been established, they do it again in this episode, that this is a great position for Kristen to hold since he doesn't come from a strong family. Drunken Viserys has taken to standing by the bonfire, and his wife Alicent goes to talk to him. He admits that he named Rhaenyra to protect the realm from Daemon. She was his only child, she was the realm's delight, and he named her out of love. And then he gets into this idea that many of his line were dragon riders, but only a few were dreamers. He had the dream that he told his wife Emma about and wanted it to be true. And there's a part of him that believes that this obsession killed Rhaenyra's mother. The doubts that he's experiencing are interesting. It's not so much about what other people want or the Council of 101 or his preferring to have a male because he thinks it might be better for the realm. He named her because he was looking for a way out of the abyss of regret and was hoping that doing that would begin to set things right. But now he has this other problem problem because she's not all that interested in behaving how he'd like. He says, what if I was wrong? And then they get interrupted by the horn for the hunt. This is a bit of insight we never had from the book. It was never really clear if he reconsidered his decision. And I suppose this shows that it wasn't really that important because what stands out is that he's telling Alicent this. He's inadvertently planting a seed in her, which could be important because as we'll see later, there's going to be a lot of pressure on her to try to get him away from Renera being the heir and making it Aegon. When the hunting party make their way into the woods, he learns that it wasn't the white heart that they were tracking. It is a giant deer though, and the whole process of the hunt, in quotes, is something. Dogs chase the animal down so that people who work for him can capture it and hold it in place so that the king can then walk up and stab it in the heart. Of course, he misses on the first try, so there's a lot of pain and suffering involved. And all of this amounts to an unsubtle way of pointing that out. If the king makes a mistake, if he finds himself a little off mark, then there will be pain and suffering. After that, we see the White Heart approach Renera, who's covered in blood. It just gives her a look and then runs away. Kristen pulls out his sword and she tells him to stop, but I'm not sure what he thought he was going to be able to do there. They come back into camp, her covered with blood, Cole dragging the carcass of the boar, and you see that Harwin Strong gives her a look and smile, while everyone else just sort of stares. I guess on some level, they've come to expect the unexpected when it comes to the princess. Back in King's Landing, Otto talks to his daughter in her chambers, highlighting how successful the hunt was to show how all the lords, all the men that were there are prime for Aegon to become king. What mother wouldn't want that? He paints the picture that even though no one can compel Viserys to change his choice of heir, there will be problems if he doesn't. Aegon is the firstborn son, and to deny him the throne would be to assail the laws of gods and men. And while that's a little dramatic, as a man of court, he knows that this is something that he can work with. He says the road ahead is uncertain, but the end is clear. Aegon will be king, and he tells her she must guide Viserys towards reason because he'll never find it on his own. And it's an interesting comparison with both of these fathers and their daughters. They both see them as pawns to their own ends on some level, and that leads them to overlook and underestimate who they are. She goes to see the king in his chambers. You see that he lost the fingers that he was using the maggots to treat in the last episode, which is something that happened in the book, but not until a little bit later. She tries to bring up the succession, but he talks about things not working out with Jason Lannister and Rhaenyra. This was meant to be another out for him and his frustrations. Marry her off, just as she'll say later, and of course it didn't work out. Then she sees a letter from the sea snake's brother. So in the end, she talks him into sending aid to his brother because it's the right thing to do. Rhaenyra gets wind of that as he's sending a messenger to the Stepstones. They have some words with her asking if Damon sent for help. He'd rather die than do that, but the king is trying to see that that doesn't happen. 
he asks if she thinks he made the wrong choice. And she says it doesn't matter because as it's been shown, no one really is concerned with what she thinks. They get into it again about him trying to marry her off and we see their contrasting points of view. His first arranged marriage worked out and he fell in love with her mother. So on that end, he knows what she's going through. But she points out that if they only married for advantage, then he wouldn't have picked Allison. He would have married the 12 year old and left her best friend alone. Now she's starting to see what everyone else is seeing, that they're going to replace her. And she sees this as him trying to marry her off while he can still get something out of the deal. He counters that this is her way to strengthen her own claim, multiply, secure her own line of succession. And then he does something somewhat surprising. He swears to her on her mother's memory that she will not be supplanted. And this may have even surprised him because he thinks about what he said and what he promised as she walks out the door. So the episode opened with a shot of these embers falling and the banner of House Valerian burning. And we saw a ship on fire with all these men on the ground removing the cargo. You also saw the crab feeder stake a man who says that House Valerian is coming for him. And as he's walking away, Damon arrives on Caraxes, causing the crab feeder's men to flee the scene. The man who was being staked was elated that someone was coming to save him, but then Caraxes crushed him with his foot when he landed. Here you see that there are limits to the power that comes with having a dragon. Caraxes burns a couple of the fleeing men, but you notice that many more of them retreat into the caves where they are shielded and safe from his fire. Damon tries to call him out, he ignores him, and then his archers start to unload on him to where he has to leave. Later when we revisit them, we get the idea that this isn't a problem that they can solve with just dragons. Their opponents can just run into these caves. You get the sense that doing this for years now has gotten old, and you see that there's low morale and even some dissent from Corliss's brother who blames Damon for their problems. There's really no reason for the crab feeders men to leave the caves, and Corliss's son Lenor has a plan to bait them by sending someone to their doorstep. He says it should be Damon, and then we see him arrive on Caraxes at the same time. While he's skulking in front of the men, the messenger Viserys sent shows up. He reads that his brother is sending help, and then almost beats the messenger to death just to remind you that he's not a great guy. Then you see that this all motivates them to put their plan in motion, and he rows himself ashore alone. He crosses the battlefield and plants a white flag of surrender. The crab feeder comes out with his mask on and his grayscale and watches him offer up Dark Sister from a safe distance. He kneels and hands it over to one of the soldiers and then pulls out his dagger and makes a charge across the field. The archers unload but miss. Everyone starts to chase him, and then eventually he gets cornered. We understand that this is part of their plan, and the crab feeder just sort of stands there and watches out for dragons. The whole thing is pretty exciting. It's exhilarating to watch him run across the field. There's a couple of things that seem weird. For instance, the entire army rush out just to try to stop this one person, and that the crab feeder is cautious, but he doesn't keep his army close. Eventually, that'll be their demise because the sea snake and his ground troops show up for a showdown and then Lenor attacks with sea smoke and saves Damon's ass. He then runs into the cave after the crab feeder and comes out with half of his body. And in his blood covered look, the episode ends with the idea that they have just solved their stepstones problem. I found watching this third episode to be a somewhat frustrating experience, but that's really the point. These are frustrating people doing frustrating things. And I loved how the big set piece of Damon being brave and dynamic and showcasing his badassery was all related to a situation that never really had to happen. The Stepstones are an important trade route, and what was happening there would have had a negative effect on the realm in that way, but the actual war was more about Corliss acting to secure his position as the richest man in Westeros, and Damon having a way to make himself feel relevant. Notice how that's reflected in so much of what the rest of the characters are doing throughout Second of His Name. 
And while the conquest of the Stepstones isn't that important, the battle and the fact that Damon survived what was practically a suicide mission is. Especially in a time of relative peace in the kingdom, a story like that is what makes legends. Plus, it reinforces him in doing whatever he wants going forward and gives him combat experience to build on. I'm guessing his charge and the dragons will be what scratches that Game of Thrones itch for people, but I found Drunk Viserys and Scheming Ass Otto to be the standout performances of the episode. What's really bothering you is that you weren't born a dreamer like Aegon the Conqueror? I guess that tracks. Patty Considine really showed up to deliver the line about dragons to Jason Lannister. It really underlines how solid their position is because of that connection they have to these natural wrecking machines. And they haven't given Reese Iffins a lot to do yet, but I thought he shined in his trying to worm his way in there to put his grandson on the throne. All while having his big brother show up to quietly remind him of his place in their family. Plus, you can't miss their underestimating of their daughters. And it's interesting to watch the two young women each discover where their power is in this messed up situation they found themselves in. Allison seems to be very perceptive. She seems to know how to talk to her husband. And she hasn't jumped immediately on board with the idea of taking away Rhaenyra's place so that her own son can prosper. And just to connect the dots, that was Corliss's son at the Step Zones, who Lionel Strong suggested for the king to match up with Rhaenyra. You see that he is a dragon rider. The plan he came up with was pretty sharp. It worked. And I suppose, based on what we know about him at this point, it seems like she could do worse. I think what stands out again this week, that is, beyond the costumes, the set design, and the performances, which are really the foundation that this is all built on, what stands out again is how intentional everything is. Without spoiling anything, I'll just say that there were a ton of seeds planted in this episode, and that it all leads me to believe that even though these characters are annoying in their own ways, that it should be entertaining as hell to watch as things develop. The character stuff all serves to put a finer point on who these people are, and you'll want to pay attention to what they tell you about themselves. And remember what they said at the beginning of the series. The only thing that could bring the House of the Dragon down is itself. And I think that's a great place to leave things. Let me know in the comments what you thought about the episode and how things are taking shape. How are the different characters hitting? And if you haven't read the book, where do you think things are heading? And if you have read it, what do you think about all the additional insight that we're getting about these characters' motivations? If you want to talk book spoilers, that's fine. Just please mark them so that they won't spoil people who haven't read ahead. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.